Coming up, meet designer Bethany Yellowtail. We catch up on all things sports with Brent Cowie and Mercedes Krause rents to represent Nevada. I'm Mark Trant, Aliyah Chavez is away. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining us. The largest native serving scholarship fund in the U.S. is announcing a new name and its next chapter, 53 years after its founding. Previously known as the American Indian Graduate Center, the organization will now be known as the Native Forward Scholars Fund. Native Forward's alumni includes prominent native people like Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. Founded during the federal Indian boarding school era, the organization's goal is to provide indigenous people with post-secondary funding. Native Forward awards $15 million in scholarships every year and has awarded more than $350 million since its inception. Angelique Albert is a Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal citizen and CEO of Native Forward. Albert spoke to ICT about the motivations behind the name change. We wanted a name that more accurately reflected who we are and who we serve. So we've been doing the work for over 50 years and wanted to be more inclusive of the students that we serve, including not just federally recognized tribes, which was depicted in our old, old name, American Indian Graduate Center. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, only 19% of native people aged 18 to 24 are enrolled in college. California schools are banning a word associated with indigenous people from its occupational titles. The San Francisco Unified School District will no longer use the word chief in job titles because of concerns from Native Americans. With nearly 10,000 employees, the district is one of the largest employers in the Bay Area. A statement from the district says that given the Native Americans members of our community have expressed concern over the use of the title, we are no longer going to use it. The decision follows a similar path with the recent renaming of a Northern California ski resort. Resort officials announced the change from the S word last year and stated the racist and sexist slur is contrary to its company's values. District officials say they haven't decided what they will use instead. Native students are continuing to exercise their right to wear regalia during graduation ceremonies. The rules governing tribal regalia at high school graduations have emerged as a legislative issue in several states. For many Native communities, eagle feathers are sacred items passed down through generations. They are used at ceremonies to signify achievement and connection with the community. One year ago, students in Utah's Cedar City High School District would have been barred from wearing any form of tribal regalia, including feathers. However, in March, Utah joined a list of states affirming Native students' right to wear tribal regalia during graduation ceremonies. Thus, in the school district that tried to bar graduates from wearing regalia at last year's ceremonies, this year, Native students are enjoying their hard-won fight. Congratulations to all of this year's graduates. In Montana, over 3,000 new and gently used children's books were delivered to the Chippewa Cree tribe in early May. Caitlin Anawa Boisel has more on how they got there. It had taken months to pull everything together. Sarah Wecker is the director of Essential Eats Distributors, which is based in Missoula, Montana. It is a nonprofit that provides resources to indigenous led programs around the state. They help deliver food, bikes, and now books to tribal communities. 
Sarah was asked to be a part of a special project to deliver books to a bookmobile to Rocky Boy. She says to her, it's all about giving back. The premise of our organization is to share in the wealth of the community I live in and to help bridge some of those gaps. Our tribal lands in Montana are extremely rural, almost all of them and extremely remote. Even with it being in a rural area, that didn't stop donors from filling up the shelves with quality books that were written specifically for Indigenous students. Wecker says an anonymous donor donated books made in Canada and they weren't cheap. Some of the books that you sent had actual, you know, Cree language in it. Can you talk a little bit about that? And at first I was like, wow, this little box of books was $500. And here we're, we sent, you know, like, you know, two pallets full of books. And then I looked through them and they were so beautiful and so filled with incredible art. The bookmobile will be driving to different areas this summer around Rocky Boy. Their goal is eventually to have a librarian on staff and for the bookmobile to serve as a food truck for community events. Uh, I think it's a good stepping stone. In Springfield, Illinois, Caitlin Onawa Boysell, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, a native in Nevada takes a run for Congress. And Jordan Bennett Begay caught up with fashion industry in Las Vegas. But first, Native women athletes are scoring big. Bethany Yellowtail has been a part of the fashion industry for over 10 years. She is the designer and founder of LA-based apparel brand B Yellowtail and the B Yellowtail Collective. She attended Res 2022 this year in Las Vegas, Nevada. ICT editor Jordan Bennett Begay sat down with her at the conference. Let's take a look. Thank you for being here, Bethany. Um, I was in your panel earlier and I just admire how you built this company, your dream company, in 13 years. I mean, what was that like and to see it grow now? Yeah, um, honestly, I st some days it still feels like I'm just getting started because there's so much to do and so much to accomplish, but um, to be where we are now, I sometimes I still can't even imagine. I can't even like. I'm sh I sh I'm shocked some days still. You know, I'm like I can't believe we're here. I can't believe we've done this. Like I grew up in Wyala, Montana, the mighty few district on the Crow Reservation. We have population of under 200 people, and um, you know I come from a cattle ranching family, and just like we're right way out in the sticks. And I always dreamed of doing this, and to be running a company of my dreams and working with people I love, um, being able to give back to my community and work with my community, it's nothing like it exists in fashion and I'm just grateful that I set out on the path and we're, we're doing it and I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. What's, um, what do you get your inspiration from for your designs? Yeah, I get my inspiration from everywhere, honestly, like just the world view of being a Native woman. Sometimes it's fabric that reminds me of my kalas, my grandmas. I remember going into um, a dead stock fabric store one day and I saw this beautiful like cotton fabric, vintage cotton fabric, and I immediately thought of my grandmothers. And I just started pulling fabric that reminded me of them, like their cotton dresses. And so some days it's that, sometimes it's a color, sometimes it's a cultural story or a design motif, but really it comes from, you know, my heart. I have to always be in like a really good way or be really thinking intentionally about what these designs are going to be putting out into the world and who's going to be wearing them and they're my uh, my extension of me you know my my love my um, my hopes my prayers for our people and then for myself so as an artist you know it's very you have to put yourself out there and I imagine it's very scary to be that vulnerable I mean how do you <laughs> deal with that <laughs> Um, sometimes I cry, you know, it's really, it's really hard. Um, it's scary to take a leap of faith on yourself in general, and then when you're in a very public space, it's absolutely hard, um, especially when our, our own people are sometimes our biggest critics, and we only want, for me, I only want to be doing well by our people, and so I'm real, I get sensitive about it, but um, my bigger picture, the bigger vision for um, my company and myself, I know um, I have a good heart and I have a really incredible support system 
um, accountability system with you know some of the best organizations in Indian country like Illuminatives or Native Wellness Institute. I have mentors around me and people to help me um, keep moving forward and help me to really like think about the way I'm making an impact beyond fashion. And I think that's probably what's most unique about the Yellow Tail. It's not just a fashion company to make clothes, or a fashion company to um, be on the runway. It's a fashion company that has bigger vision for our people. Well, and like you said in the panel earlier, one of the bigger visions is you know economic prosperity for our communities. And I think it's really interesting because I know there's some people who love to get a good deal yeah. on some earrings or a necklace, but then there's the other side of it where an artist puts so much work and labor materials in it, and they still have to put food on the table. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you tell folks who just, because I know I, I've gone to like flea markets and people are like, yes, but then they get, get discouraged by something that's out of their budget. Yeah. Well, I always think about it from first, like um, from our community perspective, like we, I come from a community where there's people who are making things all the time. And of course we want to address our people. Um, it's important that we, you know, represent in our own communities too. However, the bigger picture is how that impacts our direct families, right? Because Native entrepreneurs, when we invest in Native entrepreneurs, it means we're investing in Native families, which means we're investing in Native communities. And for me, when we started Be Yellowtail, um, or the collective particularly, we really had to help our artists um, understand how to price their work in a different manner than we're used to in our own communities because there's not disposable income. And a lot of times we trade, which is a beautiful thing. We have our own form of commerce in our communities, but to sustain our families and we have to participate in you know, the capitalist system, unfortunately, like we have to feed our families, we have to provide for our, for our own families. And so how do we do that in a way where um, it's viable, it's sustainable for ourselves, right? So um, I really came from, thankfully, my corporate fashion background. I really helped understand how to price goods appropriately. So labor costs, cost of materials. So we really work with um, the artists that have come on our platform to help price based on like just the data, the facts of like, this is how much time, this is how much labor, this is your materials. This is the formula for retail. And so when we take the emotion out of it, we take the like, oh, who can afford it or not? Like, this is what it will take to, to be like an appropriate price for your work. And it's, so it takes that kind of like um, emotional part of it and our kind of worry about who can buy it or not, or if, if our family can buy it or not, or our relatives in our community can buy it or not. And because we deserve to be able to sustain our families. And for me, that was the biggest, um, most important part of building that platform is helping entrepreneurs in my own communities first and growing that. And now I really, we've seen the way the collective has uh, impacted Indian country and helped price things and set the bar for other entrepreneurs, even if they don't sell through us, like to price their work appropriately and advocate for buying native made and paying what it's worth. Uh, thank you so much for taking time of your day to be here with us. Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate you too. Yeah, thanks. IndianSports.com covers indigenous athletes. Joining us is its co-founder, Brent Cowie. He started this website in 2000 with John Harjo when they were college students. Welcome, Brent. Hello, Mark. Good to see you again. So let's focus on uh, women's sports and start with Roger States, uh, which, by the way, airs this program at 6.30 in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, good to see everybody again. Yeah. You know we're in the we're in the at the tail end of the uh, softball season for college sports and uh, Roger State University, which is a Division II school um, out of Claremore, Oklahoma, uh, just recently won the national championship in softball. Uh, but what's great about it is we have 15 Native American girls that um, participate on the squad, uh, from starting roles to backup roles to uh, you know freshmen, red shirts, and everything. So. Uh, it was a great experience for all the girls. Uh, what's great about it too, I thought was uh, a handful of the girls were, were from some tribal schools, some uh, reservation schools that were on the team. So good experience for them and, and uh, good experience uh, or good news for the, um, you know, Indian country sports world as well. Is there anything that can happen for these athletes after college with softball? There is a small, uh, you know, uh, professional league of uh 
uh, softball teams out there. I think there's like a 12-team a league that exists out there. So there's always that opportunity to continue to pursue the ball. But a lot of these girls uh, go back into the community and use their degrees to, to, to help out in the community. I don't want to go too far on this, but one of the things that intrigues me about softball is of all the sports, it's the one that requires the quickest reaction time because that 60 feet between the pitcher and the plate is the quickest of any sport. It is. It's really, uh, sometimes you hear the term small ball and basically, you know, you, you think about baseball and power hitters and guys trying to hit it 400 feet, but softball is more of a strategy game. It's, it's taking the tools that you have and use them to your advantage. Quick girls can just bump the ball and they get to the base quicker, or you're not trying to really, you know, hit a home run. You're just trying to get in the outfield to advance the runner or get on base yourself. So it's a really uh, strategy type of sport, and uh, uh, it's really fun to watch if you get a chance. I also want to learn about Jenna Huey, who plays here in Phoenix. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, uh, uh, Phoenix College, which is a NJCAA Division II college um, there in, in Phoenix, uh, they recently won the uh, Division II National Championship for the Junior College Association uh, out in Oxford, Alabama uh, recently. And I think what was cool about her experience with the the uh, championship game was she had a th three, three run home run, three hit home run. Uh, our three runs came out on our home run. So, uh, you know, to get a home run in the championship game to help your team win the national championship, I mean, there's no better feeling than that, I'm sure. Uh, also, they played against Murray State, which is a junior college out of Oklahoma, and they also had about two or three Native American, girl, Native American girls on their squad as well. So it's kind of cool to see the girls, uh, our Native American girls, get to the, the, the final game, the championship game, and compete against each other. One other uh, note worth following is the uh, World Co Women's College World Series, and I understand there are a number of Native athletes in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the Women's College World Series is going to be uh, starting their championship finals tomorrow, but uh, they started play last Thursday, uh, and we had six Indigenous athletes that um, were on three different teams. Uh, we had uh, three girls from Oklahoma State. Uh, we had two girls from the University of Oklahoma, and we had one Native American from the UCLA squad who uh, um, bowed out on the on the Monday's night game as well. So in the championship game, we'll have Oklahoma versus Texas um, in that championship game. So we'll be cheering on from Oklahoma, Riley Boone and Macy McAdoo. Will those games be televised? Yes, the, the championship games will be on ESPN and they'll be Wednesday and Thursday and if necessary on Friday as well. So hope people can tune in and, and, and check out those games and cheer on our Native American athletes. I understand from Oklahoma State, we have a home run leader. Yeah, um, Oklahoma State, again, they bowed out last night. They have uh, Cheyenne Factor, who's Seminole, and Sydney Pennington, uh, who's Cherokee. And she's the one who is the, she leads as the, uh, a senior, she leads as the uh, program's career home run leader at 47 home runs over her career. So um, a lot of talent. They're a partnership with uh, the Nike N7 program, and they uh, wear their turquoise jerseys for a uh, uh, Native American heritage game. So they're really uh, embracing the Native American athletes are at, at that institution. And then I wanted to hear more about Seneca Kuro. Yeah, Seneca Kuro, she plays for UCLA. Uh, she's from the Mission Band of Barona Indians, I believe. Um, and she's a sophomore uh, with the program, but she's played with the program for three years. Um, she actually started in the College World Series when she was a, not started, but she played in the College World Series when she was a freshman. And now they come back as a, as a sophomore. And she had a couple of hits in the game. Uh, I was able to visit with her after the game, and she was just really excited about her opportunity to come back and have a major role uh, in the team this time uh, with the team being in the infield and the outfield and doing whatever the team needed to do to, um, you know, try and win the games. Like I said, they advanced to the semifinals um, and, you know, they they bowed out in, in, a, in a loss in, in the semifinals. But, you know, she's a great player. She's going to be an impact player for their squad, and she'll be back, you know, for her junior and senior uh, season coming up. 
We only have about a minute left, but I want to ask about a Native American, a Native American woman in the U.S. in the uh, U.S. Open golf tournament. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also going on over the weekend was the you know U.S. Open women's golf tournament. We have Gabby Lamo. Uh, she's a Shoshone and Paiute, and she was the first Native American woman to play in the U.S. Open golf tournament, uh, which was a neat experience. Uh, she's been playing on the Epson Tour for the past four or five years, I believe, uh, which is kind of like a uh, a pre-tour to the LPGA tour and she's just trying to get her tour card and she was able to go to a U.S. Open qualifier and qualify for the U.S. Open and uh, you know she got to play uh, she didn't make it into the weekend uh, it was our first time playing she had a good experience she had a wonderful time with it and I'm sure we're going to continue to hear about her more and more in the future uh, on the golf tours. That's exciting you know one of the things that's trying to have a few seconds but more and more native high schools are picking up golf as a sport, I notice. Yes, yes. I mean, you got a lot of first time programs that are starting out with two or three players and, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, it's it's growing and growing uh, across different reservations. So for me, I'm a, I'm an avid golfer. So it's good to see all these uh, programs starting golf at their high schools now. Brent, thank you. You're welcome. For years now, ICT has been keeping track of indigenous candidates running for office, from local to national races. Mercedes Krauss is running for Nevada's second congressional district. We interviewed her at the Reservation Economic Summit in Nevada to ask, why is she running? For me, I think the quality of life element, it goes into everything. It goes into our housing costs, we have a situation here where out of state and out of country investors are buying and, and corporations are buying homes and everyday people don't have a place, a safe, clean place to live. Our cost of living does not match our, you know, our pay scale that is happening here. So livable wages and again, uh, access to safe housing, access to health care. Um, I am definitely for uh, health care for all, Medicare for all. Um, again, yeah, I, I feel like everything goes back to every single person deserving a dignified quality of life. Advanced Political Leadership is an organization that helped Krauss make the decision to run. Jordan James Harville is its National Program Director. Out of that class, we graduated eight folks um, who went on um, to become our first set of alumni. Um, many of them went back to the states and took those tools and implemented them in the work that they were actually doing so that we got some immediate impact out of that. But one of those candidates, Mercedes Krauss, um, who's a Guala Lakota herself, actually decided to run. And so she ran for the Nevada 2nd Congressional District, and she's currently running. She's one of our candidates, which is incredibly exciting. And it's the district with the number one um, or the most set of tribal nations in Nevada um, in, in that particular district. And so why she chose to run there is, um, you know, regardless of the kind of election outcomes, what she really wanted to do was pull in all of the tribes in this process of what does it look like to build part political participation within the tribes? How do we get invested in these campaigns? Because if we're not making decisions and at the table, decisions are being made for us. And so what does that look like? I am an Emerge graduate. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I have been preparing to run for office for a while. Um, one of my Emerge sisters, I want to shout her out also, Shay Bacchus. Uh, she is from the Cherokee Nation. She's also running. Um, but what really made the difference for me is participating in the Advanced Native Political Leadership Program. Because when I was doing that, you know, uh, being in a group with a community focus and realizing that, you know, I don't have to fit into some kind of mold, that it's a game, the political game, that that is not the case, that we are really able to make a change. We are really able to bring our voice to the table to help us get the changes that we want to see. I'm also the chair for our Nevada Native American Caucus. And when it was coming around time for filing, we were calling leaders around the state, um, trying to get them to run. And I said, you know what, if I'm asking other people to do something, I need to do it also. So in Nevada, we make up about 5.1% of the population, according to the last census. And so with that, we should have 64 indigenous representatives to, to have balanced representation. 
we do not have that in our state. We're not close to that. But you know what? We are one person at a time, one voice at a time, building ourselves up to that. Uh, I was privileged to work with uh, people around the state for our get out the vote work in the last election. And, you know, I'll just tie it back to our goals as a Native American caucus. Get more Native candidates on the ballot, get our strategic priorities out there and, you know, beyond our community, out there into the larger community of Nevada. And then also so important is our get out the vote work. Uh, Congressional District 2 holds 18 of our 27 tribal communities here in Nevada. So it's really important, you know, um, not to speak for any community, but, you know, as constituents in that area represent their needs based on what they're telling me. We have a lot of issues going on where we need protection of sacred sites. Uh, you know, uh, mining companies have, you know, there's a history of them coming into the community, uh, polluting areas and, you know, contaminating the water for communities. and that is not slowing down. So that is, in a nutshell, why I put my hat in the ring to run this election. That was Mercedes Krause, an Oglala Lakota running for Congress in Nevada. The primary is June 14th. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I'm Mark Trahant. Sometimes you got to take a stand. Run, you got to run.